Coronavirus pandemic from the state house. Let's listen in. Three or four, five, six days um, is going to determine a lot for us. And we are flattening the curve. We are slowing the spread. It's making a difference. We're, we are um, looking right at that surge and, and trying to uh, suppress it. And uh, your efforts are paying off. And so that's not just in saving lives, but that's uh, allowing us to care for more of those folks who are in need and do it in a very methodical and responsible way. So thank you, first and foremost. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chris Box, the Commissioner of the Department of Health. Thank you, Governor. As always, we'll start with some of the data that you can see updated on a daily basis with our dashboard. As you can see here, we've had a total of um, 313 new positive cases that we've reported with unfortunately 37 deaths here in the state of Indiana from COVID-19. When we look at our overall death toll, Indiana now has 387 total deaths for the state. When we look at detailed reporting, we've tested over 46,000 Hoosiers. Our numbers uh, yesterday were down a little bit for total testing, and that's really because we had some labs take some time off over the weekend to relax after about four to six weeks of working nonstop here in the state. Going forward, we also are looking at our ICU bed availability. We continue to see that we have about 46% of our beds that are available. Of those that are being used, about 25% are COVID-related cases and about 29% are non-COVID. And that has remained stable to actually a little bit increasing for our availability of ICU beds. When we look at ventilator availability, we can see that about 75% of our ventilators across the state are um, available for use, with about 14.9% or 15% that are being used now for COVID-related illness, and about 10% 10.6% for non-COVID. And again, that ventilator usage is actually, we have more ventilators uh, available than uh, typical over the last two to three weeks. Unfortunately, we were also notified early this morning of the death of an offender at Westville Correctional Facility, and that has not been included in our numbers today. We're working very closely with the Department of Corrections to provide whatever assistance that they need. Prisons, just like long-term care facilities and residential facilities, are facilities where we have individuals living in congregate settings, and we've always known that they are in increased risk. And that, why, that is why at the State Department of Health, we have prioritized them along with our long-term care facilities and residential facilities, making sure that our strike team is available to go out and to investigate any outbreaks, test any individuals that are showing symptoms, and making sure that we work with infection control and helping the facilities um, along uh, with um, the Department of Corrections to make sure that we can protect these individuals. As with any congregate setting, long-term care facilities continue to be our biggest concern here in this pandemic. We are using every tool available to try to limit the residents in these facilities that are known uh, to be sick or get sick. Unfortunately, many times when we go in to test the first symptomatic individuals, there are already multiple other individuals that have been exposed and are positive for COVID-19 at that time. They may be symptomatic or pre-symptomatic. As you know, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has actually issued guidance prohibiting communal dining and has imposed very strict re restrictions with regards to visiting except in the end-of-life circumstances where they continue to allow this. Today, I'm taking additional steps to help further contain the spread of COVID-19 in our long-term care facilities. I've issued an order authorizing that long-term care facilities allow the transfer, discharge, or transport of otherwise or otherwise relocate patients or residents in accordance with the plans and guidance from the Indiana State Department of Health. This includes transfers within a facility, transfers between facilities, and transfers across city or county boundaries. This order will help the facilities to better be able to cohort residents who have tested negative to protect them from infection. It will also allow facilities um, to receive, uh, that receive ISDH approval to develop COVID-dedicated units going forward.
I know that the thought of moving residents in an already difficult time is incredibly stressful for families, and we have made it clear that families need to be notified of these plans. I also understand that the thought of COVID de dedicated units or facilities has created controversies in some parts of our state. I want to assure everyone that both of these approach approaches are scientifically sound and not only can help protect individuals from getting COVID-19, but also can improve the quality of life for those who have tested positive. Positive. In memory care units across the state, when we've had to isolate individuals because they're COVID positive, we are getting reports that, that individuals are not eating and that they're basically withdrawing even further. And so if we can document that a large percentage of patients are positive, COVID-19 positive, we can once again um, loosen the restrictions and allow those individuals to have more interaction and be able to eat together and thereby improve their quality of life. We can also better protect when we cohort these patients, our health care providers, making sure that they have all the PPE that they need and are required, and making sure that um, we are testing them as indicated. I want to make it clear that this order does supersede any order that is issued by a local health department, and it will remain in, in effect through the duration of this public health emergency. This is not a decision that I made very lightly. It has been incredibly important to me that I have been supportive of local health officers and local communities across our state and have enact, interacted very closely with them. But we fully believe that this is a necessary step to help to further protect the vulnerable residents in our 92 counties. Finally, I want to update you on the status of the drive through clinics that we've launched yesterday in Evansville, Fort Wayne, Gary, and Sellersburg. We were able to test a total of 465 symptomatic Indiana health care workers, first responders, and essential workers between those four sites and hope to see those numbers grow today. In order to increase our testing of Hoosiers who are sick, starting tomorrow we are expanding who can be tested at our drive through clinics. If you're a health care worker, a first responder, or an essential worker, and someone in your household is symptomatic or sick, please bring that individual to us to be tested. We know that if someone in your household is sick and you're a nurse or a physician, you really should probably stay home because of the risk of you showing up with a sickness. If we can test that individual and know that they're negative, then we feel much better about you being able to go about your job using your mask and going on and taking care of our most needy across the state. If you're not a health care worker, first responder, or an essential worker, but you're at higher risk, maybe due to your age or um, uh, your weight or other underlying health conditions, if you're symptomatic, please come and get tested at our sites. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Box. Um, today we're also uh, pleased to be joined uh, in person, properly physically distanced, uh, but in person by the Dean of our delegation, Senator Todd Young. And um, we have been in constant contact, our staffs have been in daily constant contact with one another throughout this whole ordeal. But it's very good of you to be here and give us an update on the help that's on the way. You've been out there on the front lines proving that this truly is teamwork with the, the federal partnership and the state partnership and the local partnership. Um, but you've passed in, I'd say, record time, three very important bills, acts that are going to have a, a direct positive impact on our hospitals, our employees, and our employers. And I wonder if you just elaborate on that. Well, thank you so much, Governor. I, I thank you for this invitation. I, I thank you for the professional relationship and for the friendship and for your tireless service uh, on behalf of Hoosiers. Um, I have to say, recent weeks have been inspiring to me as, as I see uh, the neighborliness of Hoosiers at this difficult time uh, as they reach out to, to help one another in need. Um, as I, f I feel the solidarity of one Hoosier uh, reaching out to another and doing whatever they can to be of assistance. I, I would say uh, at the state level here, the governor and his team have shown exceptional leadership. They've been in constant, regular, clear communication uh, with the people of Indiana, and the governor has allowed public health experts to strongly inform policy responses, and I think that's essential as we focus on keeping every Hoosier household safe and secure so that we can get on the back end of this virus as quickly as possible, return to some semblance uh, of normalcy, which I know is their, their emphasis. Because Hoosiers have rightly had to social distance and shelter in place, 
our focus at the federal level is trying to make our, our households whole. Um, we're telling people they can't go to work. They're doing the right thing by staying at home. They need to be able to pay their bills. So we recognize that. We also recognize that with so many of our businesses, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to do business when one is social distancing. So we wanted those businesses to be around on the back end of this. So we also want to make our employers whole. Uh, we want to make sure that we take care of our health care workers as well, those who are on the front lines of this fight and who are going to help us see the end of, of this fight ultimately. So I thought I'd give a quick overview of some of the provisions of the federal legislation the governor referred to, the CARES Act. It's a bill that passed with broad bipartisan support. It passed in a record amount of time, and it happens to be the largest economic recovery package in American history. And I'm, I'm proud that we came together as a country to get this done on behalf of Hoosiers and other Americans. So the first uh, aspect of this package that will be of interest to Hoosier households are the payments directly to households, $1,200 per individual, $2,400 per married couple, $500 per dependent. Those payments should be going out the door this week and hitting bank accounts for those who do not have uh, uh, bank deposit information on file with the IRS. They either need to put that information on file with the IRS uh, or instead they will be receiving a hard check and it will take two to three weeks for that uh, check to go out, we are told. Um, the other aspect that I know will be of, of interest to uh, all Hoosiers is the employer aspect. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program is now up and running. It's been very popular. In fact, in the state of Indiana, uh, the Small Business Administration tells us that over 235,000 loans have been made, totaling roughly $6 billion, $5.98 billion to date. This program authorized a full $350 billion for small business loans. And we know that the vast majority of this money will be paid back because, of course, the purpose of the program is to keep our employees attached to their workforce. And uh, as long as the monies are used for that purpose and to meet other fixed costs, uh, those loans will be forgivable loans. Another piece that will be very important, I know, to Hoosiers is uh, the unemployment provisions. We're working directly with the state, uh, which is experiencing uh, uh, a volume of, of uh, application that they've never experienced before. The good workers here at the state of Indiana are doing what they can to, to implement the provisions of this beefed up pandemic unemployment compensation program. And uh, we are working with them on that as well. That applies not just to your uh, conventional category of unemployed workers, but also to independent contractors. Uh, the self-employed and gig economy workers. We want to make sure that all Hoosiers, all Americans who find themselves out of work on account of the COVID-19 situation uh, are able to care for themselves. Uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, this remains a topic of conversation. Uh, I'm proud that as part of this, of this over $2 trillion package that we passed at the federal level, $100 billion of it was dedicated towards ensuring that our health care providers have access to the sorts of resources they need to better serve patients, to take care of, of their frontline health care workforce, and uh, to make sure Americans are safe and secure. Um, as it relates to Indiana, over 23,000 companies have been approved for over $6 billion worth of, of PPE. And my team and I, I know, have been working very closely with the governor's team and with other individuals around the state of Indiana to adapt, improvise, and overcome, to manufacture where we can, to procure where we can as well. In fact, a large shipment is expected to come in from China very soon. My team helped clear the way uh, with visas and travel permissions and logistics. So these are the sorts of things that we're doing on behalf of Hoosiers to implement this program. Uh, as I indicated, it's over $2 trillion. There are, are additional provisions uh, that will help our states and municipalities with more flexible funding. Uh, that will help our education institutions from higher ed all the way down through K through 12. 
And uh, we want to make sure our Hoosier farmers who are experiencing some unique challenges right now with over half of um, people's meals in this country coming from restaurants, we understand that social distancing was required to keep folks safe and secure, but that uh, has interrupted the food supply chain. And uh, on the back end of this, uh, we're trying to make our farmers whole and, and make sure that they too are able to pay their bills and, and uh, ensure that we can uh, restore some semblance of normalcy. So with that, I am happy to kick it back to the governor. And uh, I just want to thank Hoosiers once again for this opportunity to be of service during this uh, challenging time. I would invite you, if you have any questions about some of the matters that I just brought to your attention, to visit our website at young.senate.gov forward slash coronavirus, where some of these federal programs are explained. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Young. This is, um, we're keeping our eye on both sides of this equation equally important. It's kind of like a teeter-totter where you have to make sure it's balanced, where we've, we've got healthy Hoosiers ready to go to work, and then you're helping us provide that bridge for them to get back to work uh, as we emerge from where we are today. You use the word inspiring about our Hoosier neighbors, and that's kind of a common theme throughout this all. We've just seen families um, who are in great distress making the most of it. And you just see examples. We see them every day. We hear from them every day through constituent letters or through phone calls or emails. Uh, it really is fueling. And when you think about just all the different ways people are expressing um, the gener their generosity and their charity, um, it's, it's not too much to say it's beautiful. And especially in the um, area of artistic abilities, and we see this from southern Indiana to northern Indiana. In, in Jeffersonville, Indiana, there's a, a lady named Lori Reeder uh, who is taking on a project of her own through social media mostly, but she's taking a kind of a photographic um, journal, uh, an album, if you will, uh, photographing neighbors and calling it her porch portraits project and capturing just this, almost this, um, the renewed bonds from across the street that maybe have become distanced before this. And now they're starting to come together and she's, Lori's capturing those. And so I know Lori is just on social media right now, but I'm, I'm a little old school and I'm looking forward to the coffee table book and I will purchase one when it, when it goes out. Um, we we're also seeing, we see this, you've had some sent to you, um, kind of a sidewalk chalk art projects. Um, again, that's happening everywhere and that's happening from our youngest, um, who are starting to express their artistic ability to the professionals out there. Maybe not just art teachers, but you know, um, art teachers and professional artists who are going out to the street and, and leaving encouraging words for um, their neighbors, um, high school graduates, um, uh, what would have been a prom, or our healthcare professionals. And up in Goshen, Indiana, um, at Goshen Health, um, they're sharing all these, you know, you might call them simple messages of support and of hope. And it is just, as I've said in the past, as infectious as uh, the coronavirus is itself. And it's making a big difference and donations are coming in, care packages are coming in for our healthcare professionals, those folks on the front lines, and, and just reinforcing that we're gonna stand by you because you're standing by us. And this is making a huge difference to get people from one day to the next so they can help others get from one day to the next. And so I just wanted to say thank you at the outset before we get to uh, the Q&A portion um, of the day. And the Senator has been kind enough to, to be here for the whole duration of this. So if there are federal questions as well as questions for any of us, the whole task force is here and we're happy to take questions as they come to mind. Angelica Robinson, Wayne TV. Good afternoon, Angelica. Hi, Governor Holcomb. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question. There's a lot of concern um, surrounding COVID-19 in nursing homes and other facilities like that. Um, you know, where can families go to get answers about if there's a positive case at a nursing home facility 
Um, or, you know, are you guys considering some type of order that would require nursing homes to have to report that to families if there's a positive case in the building? I'll turn it over to you. You've said from the very um, outset your your number one concern was nursing homes, but we're, our concern, Angelica, has always been for 6.7 million plus Hoosiers, but for folks who are living in confined areas, whether it be nursing homes, assisted living, our Department of Corrections, uh, we've placed a special emphasis on our strike teams being available to get in and to help and assist from the moment we uh, learn of an issue. And that's exactly what you've been doing at nursing homes as well. I'll, I'll lateral it to you now. Thanks, Governor. So I think it's really important to know that from the outset, when I told you that we visited all, you know, 535 plus our additional 300 residential facilities, we gave them a checklist. And one of the most important things on that checklist was that if if someone became ill, someone was suspicious for COVID-19 or positive for COVID-19 or died, that they should definitely immediately notify their public health officials there in, the, in their particular county and the Indiana State Department of Health while at the same time notifying families. And I think that really, that, that notification lies with the facility to let families know what is going on. And I wanna emphasize that with regards to any individuals that we may move, if they're COVID-19 negative, to try to protect them from getting infected in a facility that has a large number of cases, or individuals that we might move because they're COVID positive. That, that responsibility lies with the particular residential facility or the long-term care facility. You want to elaborate just for a second on the strike teams, the not 10 but 11 strike teams and how mm -hmm. they are operating yeah. in nursing homes specifically? Yeah, I think we're actually up to 15 or 16 now, Governor, because uh, it's been, 24 it's hours. been growing. <laughs> but, but realistically, again, the concept of the strike team was we know that elderly individuals in long-term care facilities, it's very difficult to move them. And we really didn't want them early on moved to hospitals where they might actually run the risk of getting infected with COVID-19 if they had some other type of respiratory infection. So we wanted to be able to go to them. And so in addition to going out at the very beginning and taking all this information uh, from um, CMS with regards to you know infection control and checklist and things to make sure that they were doing and and we originally told them al almost immediately I think it was mid March to put masks on everybody that was coming in to work within the facility but the strike team comes out if, if we get a call within 24 hours to actually test any individual who is sick and we actually will question anybody in that area we test um, employees at the same time then depending on those tests we go back and do further testing of other individuals that may have been exposed because that nurse passed meds all down a certain hall or that particular certified nursing assistant uh, worked with a different group of individuals. And we've even actually been testing asymptomatic individuals because we've unfortunately found that a large number of these individuals are asymptomatic or what we call pre-symptomatic, meaning they just haven't had time to develop symptoms and they're positive. So as we start to cohort individuals, we wanna make sure that we are, you know, separating the right groups of people. Sherry with the Indianapolis Star. Good afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Dr. Box. I wanted to ask um, a question, two questions. One is, so, do you test every individual before in the nursing homes before you move that person to make sure that you have a clear um, status on the individuals before they get moved? Yes, so for instance, if we had a large number of cases and wanted to move uh, individuals that we thought were negative, they were showing no symptoms, we would test them. And if they test negative and they're asymptomatic, we would move them uh, to another part of the facility or another facility, but kind of quarantine them for the next 14 days with this concept that they could still become positive in the future, and we don't want, that, want to run that risk of potentially infecting another part of the facility or another facility. Nikki Kelly, Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Good afternoon, Nikki. I think we cut Sherry's second question off, but we'll come, we'll come back to Sherry maybe. Go ahead, Nikki. Hi, Governor. I just wanted to ask both you and Dr. Fox. Um, we seem to have pushed the surge out pretty well, and obviously we can keep doing that, but there's a cost to sure. and society. So my question is, since our capacity seems so good, how flat does the curve have to be for you to lessen the restrictions? You, you cut right to the chase, Nikki, thank you. Uh, uh, I, that's why I've said over the next three, four, five days that this, the suppression of the curve 
we are determining that peak or we are determining that surge in large part. Now this thing could morph and evolve and mutate and, and go a whole different direction. Um, but right now, that's why I'm encouraging Hoosiers to stick with what's working right now. You said, Senator, very early on, we're going to prepare for the worst so we hopefully don't get there. Yes. And that's exactly what we did from day one. And that's exactly the position we find ourselves in. We, are, we mourn for every loss that we have to endure. Um, but we have, as you say, uh, Nikki, we have managed our resources well. And we find ourselves in a position to where we can care for those in need. Uh, what we don't want to do is prematurely loosen up. And over the next week, um, and that's why I've said and, and, and planned this out in increments of two weeks to date, may not do that going forward. Uh, we're on the right road uh, to recovery right now, but we're not going to pull up too soon. So to answer your question directly, and you can pile on, um, Dr. Box, but uh, to answer your question very directly is I believe that the next week or so is going to answer your question, Nikki, is when, when that surge occurred, is occurring or will occur. We're right there where all the data, all these models thrown together and averaged out, everything that we're looking at that is Indiana-centric, specific to what's happening on the ground here, whether it's in Evansville or Gary or Jeffersonville, Sellersburg, wherever, Richmond or Fort Wayne, Angola. We're, we're looking at the whole big picture of the state of Indiana. And what we've determined is this is a critically important week for us, and we need to finish it strong. I would agree, agree, Governor, and I think we hear a lot of um, national talk about what's good for the coast to start doing, like New York City or, or California, but realistically, the Midwest is in a different place, and we really need to look at what Indiana is doing with regards to the numbers and what our surrounding states are doing. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that, um, as I mentioned earlier this week, I'm in regular contact with the governor of Kentucky and regular contact with the governor of Ohio. We're comparing notes. It's been shown that the Great Lakes region has done a fairly good job of mitigating um, our, our connections and uh, our travel, and that's had a significant positive impact, unlike in some other places. Um, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll march forward together as a state, and I'll, uh, I'll not surprise my neighboring states by actions that we take in the future as well. We'll go back to Sherry now. Uh, Sherry, number two. Thank you. It's, I think it's a quick question. Dr. Box, can you talk about right now how many patients are, uh, estimate of how many patients are hospitalized and whether we're seeing that number increasing or decreasing over the past week? You know, Sherry, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't bring those numbers with me. I have an idea of those individuals that are in the hospital. Um, based on ICU beds, but we are going to have more information later this week with regards to hospital admissions and discharges. So I think you'll be happy to, to see that. Um, so I'm sorry, I just don't have those numbers off the top of my head right now. We'll get you the info, Sherry. We'll get it to you directly. Brianna Cooper, the Indianapolis Recorder. Hello, Brianna, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, there have been calls recently to release inmates convicted of minor charges uh, to help curb the spread of the virus in Indiana prisons. Um, given the death of an inmate at Westfield Correctional Facility, as Dr. Box mentioned earlier, is this something that you're planning on doing at this time? It is not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Victoria Ratliff, the State House file. Good afternoon, Victoria. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I've got two questions. The first is earlier today, the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus um, named a couple of recommendations they had, which um, included um, amping up testing, especially in black neighborhoods. Um, so I just wanted your thoughts on a couple of those. And also, do you guys think we could ever go back to a quote unquote normal without <laughs> widespread testing? You want to take the first one first, and then I'll take the second. Or you okay. Can, Do you want? Okay. Amping more testing in urban areas. Sure. So that's uh, part of the targeted testing that we're doing right now in trying to get in uh, to areas in Gary and Maryville and uh, down in Sellersburg, down in Vanderburg County. 
um, and in Allen County was the point was to get uh, to those populations actually go to them rather than for them to have to come to us we tried to make sure that we picked uh, sites with Ivy Tech where we knew it was on a bus line we wanted to make sure that we were testing essential workers because uh, we know that that frequently would get at some of more of our minority populations um, do we do we get back to a complete normal without a vaccine to protect some of our high-risk individuals without more testing or quicker testing? That's very difficult, the normal, the way we knew it before this all started. But there definitely could be a new norm before that that we just have to be very careful with. Yeah, you know, I, would, I would say, Victoria, also that it won't be flipping a light switch on. We won't go, you know, immediately back to the way it was. Um, and so things will be different. Employees need to know when they go to work, they're going to a safe environment. And fortunately, in a state like Indiana, we know our employers want the same thing and are providing that. They're already adapting. We've already seen this occur all over the state of Indiana with our essential businesses that are operating. They have adapted. And so that new normal that everyone talks about may um, contemplate taking temperature at the workplace, different cleanliness standards, wearing masks, uh, physical distancing that is a little different uh, than it was before. But we will, as we, you know, kind of rolling reopen in the coming weeks, months ahead, and when you say months, you know, 14 months, 18 months to get that vaccine, ultimately that vaccine, contemplating antibodies as well. Um, but it'll be an ongoing process and every industry, Senator, you might want to talk about this as well because you know you talk about the airlines. Folks yes. are going to be yes. So, uh, if you, with your leave, I'd, I'd like to wax a little philosophical uh, related to this question because there's there's a deeper aspect uh, uh, of it as well, and I think many of us have, have been reflecting on this. I hope we don't go back to uh, complete normal. I mean, we are learning a number of things over the course of this very uh, tragic and, and challenging period of American history, we're learning some things about uh, unique ways to work, uh, unique ways to play, uh, unique ways to learn and prepare ourselves for uh, even more rewarding careers, uh, the ability to leverage technologies which can lead to productivity enhancements. Um, but without putting too fine a point on it, we're also, uh, as we undergo this, you might call it a sort of a national stress test. Uh, it's a very challenging one, uh, but we are uh, putting a great magnifying glass on, on top of some public challenges that I think all of us need to address, uh, uh, many of which it, the state of Indiana has been way out in front of, blessedly. So, um, you know, we are in many respects a divided nation. Much has been said and, 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 and will be said about this uh, politically, geographically, socioeconomically, and, and, and so forth. Well, I mean, this gives us a real opportunity as, as some of those uh, differences become magnified on the back end to, to uh, sort of bolster our resolve. To, uh, to tackle these challenges through creative solutions where we can build some consensus around them. Um, I think the process of, 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 of social distancing and sheltering in place has made us recognize, um, uh, you know, how lonely some of our neighbors really feel on a daily basis. We have a loneliness epidemic in this country. We had it before this effort, so that's, that's been magnified. We'll need to address that as a country. Um, our child care system, we, we uh, at the federal level, need to be more attentive, I would say, to ensuring more people are attracted to taking care of our young people as uh, increasingly we have, we have two parents working outside of the home. So um, that's something. Perhaps most importantly, though, I think as a country, we're recognizing how much we need one another, how much we miss one another, how much we love one another, people unlike us. And uh, we, we shouldn't forget that. Uh, we should remember that we're all in this thing together. We're one nation, and we have an opportunity. Once we get past the near-term challenges, which we will overcome, we have an opportunity to be a stronger nation on the back end of this. So in short answer to your question, I hope we and will be scarred. There will be some difficult memories as, as we think of this time, but um, I hope we can, we can build on, on these strengths as well. Well said. Kathy Treder, Ferdinand News.
Hello, Kathy. Thanks for joining us again. Kathy, you have to unmute your own microphone. We'll start. Okay, I'm unmuted, I believe. Is that correct? You are. Loud and clear now. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon, Doctor. And my, my question, though, today is going to be directed at Governor and Senator. Um, I know President Trump has said he plans to reopen the country by May 1st. Do you have the latitude, do we have the latitude as a state to remain maybe under under the um, orders to stay at home and such, or, or if he opens the country, is the country open? Let me take this. I'll follow Sir. up. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a legal matter. There's no question that the governor has, has uh, been operating within the law to uh, keep people safe and secure and ask them to social distance and to shelter at home. And um, I commend him and, and his team for implementing those measures. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I know that uh, the state team here has always had a very good relationship uh, with the White House, fighting on behalf of Hoosiers, advancing the interests of Hoosiers. I know that because I've been in the room uh, when, when a lot of these conversations have occurred. Um, I would just say that as it relates to the May 1st date, look, the president put out there commendably an aspirational goal. He's trying to maintain hope among the American people uh, during this difficult time. And uh, in the end, he's demonstrated that he will listen to the public health experts, and that will inform his policy response, which is why, for example, the president of the United States decided to uh, forbid any more flights from China. He took great criticism. There's incredible pushback um, coming from a, a number of corners when he made this decision. Retrospectively, it ended up being one of the smartest decisions he's made as president, and I think it, it saved a lot of lives. So um, I, I commend him for that. Yeah, and I just say, Kathy, agree with that, and uh, um, echo what Senator Young just mentioned. And, you know, my experience with this administration is they've been in touch with every governor, quite frankly, multiple times per week and on the weekends to gauge what's going on the ground. They're looking at the same data that we're looking at and we're all comparing notes. And so uh, the president is aspirational about this, but he cares deeply about what's going on the ground in Indiana and South Dakota and how that's changing day by day by day. He understands this and we'll continue to work together. This will be a partnership. Adam Van Ostel, Hannah News. Hello, Adam. Good afternoon. Hey there. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, is that operating as you intended or hoped? And uh, looking ahead to possibly further additional stimulus packages or aid programs, uh, what should the priorities for that be? Yeah, so the Paycheck Protection Program is operating as expected and increasingly as I hoped. Um, I was just on a uh, Zoom teleconference with uh, a bunch of bankers yesterday and um, to a person. They indicated that this program was not only popular among their small business clients, uh, but the rate of uptake uh, was remarkable. I think I, I mentioned it earlier, but uh, just here in the state of Indiana, we have over 235,000 loans totaling nearly six billion dollars so uh, the program because Congress working with this president was very uh, rapid in our response uh, in all fairness to the Small Business Administration we didn't give them a lot of time to staff up and prepare for the uh, for the uh, flurry of applications that would be coming in they have been responsive they've issued some more guidance and as they do that we've seen more banks participating more credit unions more online uh, banks and uh, we've seen uh, a lot of small businesses getting much needed assistance was there a second part of that question uh, another package on its way, maybe. Oh. Yeah. So there is um, bipartisan, there's nonpartisan agreement, to my knowledge, that we need to replenish the Paycheck 
protection program. If you look at current trend lines, it will de be depleted. No one knows exactly when, but in coming days or weeks. And my own belief is that if you have uniform agreement that something needs to be done and you have the ability to pass that through unanimous consent in the United States Senate and through a voice vote in the House of Representatives then signed into law by the President of the United States, we should go ahead and, and move forward on those areas of common agreement just as we did with the CARES Act. And then if there are other areas um, that constitute principal disagreements, uh, we'll have those conversations later, maybe when we return to session on May 4th. Thank you. Jerrica, Wave TV. Sure. Good afternoon, Jerrica. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good, Good. afternoon. Um, so since we know nursing homes are a concern and once when there, there are reports, strike teams respond. But what are those teams seeing in terms of root for, for improvement or a form of proactivity to prevent the spread or to prevent it from coming into these places? Mm -hmm. So I think for the most part, we're seeing that nursing homes are, are doing a good job of trying to protect their residents. They, they carry very deeply for them. And one of the things that has affected me the most is the calls that I've gotten from administrators and um, other individuals that work in these nursing homes and the overwhelming grief they have because of the cases that they have or the loss of life um, from the nursing homes. I will say that um, it does help for us to go through protective ways for how they put on and take off their equipment so we make sure that they themselves don't get infected um, if they're not already infected and it really has helped us to uh, help them cohort individuals and to help direct how they might break their particular facilities up so that they can give the best protection not only to the employees but to the residents who live there. Emma Kate Chalkby. Hello Emma, good afternoon. Hi Governor. Um, we talked to low-income families in Marion County who are not able to take advantage of free internet offers from Spectrum because of old unpaid bills. Um, parents say they can't pay those old bills while they're unemployed due to the coronavirus crisis, which leaves their children without access to online schoolwork. Um, Chalkbeat's reporting in New York prompted Spectrum to waive those past due bill policies for two months. So what is your response to these policies in Indiana? And is the state doing anything to encourage companies to make free internet more available to families? Yeah, we're working with the Department of Education on you know different options. One may be uh, through this online learning and e-learning, so to speak, but also there are some remote educational opportunities as well. And so we need to hear from those parents directly as well so we can connect them with the resources or with the right option that works so that their child um, can can remain in an institutional environment um, while they're not in a physical building in school. So happy to follow up with them. Um, haven't it hasn't been requested of us, uh, to my knowledge, about waiving someone's past due bills um, on their cable or their internet service. But we want to make sure, and there are other ways to provide that education, and we'll work with the school corporation, the Department of Education, and the State Board of Education uh, jointly to resolve these type exact issues. Louis, Fort Wayne's NBC News. Hello, Louis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Dr. Box. Uh, my question is specifically in regards to Bethlehem Woods. It's a nursing home here in Fort Wayne. Our understanding, we are told that allegedly several people have tested positive for COVID-19. My specific questions, there's two. Um, are there any confirmed positive cases at this facility? And if so, how many? And what steps have state officials, uh, health officials taken specifically at this facility to make sure members and residents are safe? And if you have it, what will those steps look like going forward? Um, the State Department of Health is going to only report on aggregate data with regards to our residential facilities, our long-term care facilities, um, Department of Corrections, rather than on individual facilities. That would be information you would need to get through the facility. But I can tell you what we do in routine if, if we go in and test somebody that's symptomatic and they're positive. As I mentioned, we're back in within the next 24 hours and we're starting to help them cohort individuals and to separate individuals that are negative to do more testing and to talk about infection control to make sure that they have the amount of uh, personal protective equipment that they need to not only protect the employees there. 
And we'll be there on day one and we'll be there every day thereafter, not just to assist, but as Dr. Box just said, to assist. Megan from WRTV. Hello, Megan. Good afternoon. Hey, I'm looking for an update on um, employment today. Quick question. We know um, the Department of Workforce Development and the unemployment system has been overwhelmed with a record number of new filings. Um, but we also know that they've added some new staff members and you guys are working with some other companies. How do you feel that that is going so far? And is anything else going to be done in the coming weeks or months yeah. to help those who are unemployed? And we didn't build Rome in a day, but we're trying to. And uh, Fred Payne, you want to give us an update? Sure. So last week, uh, we implemented a new system with a third party provider. We added 100 uh, people on Tuesday, and we started phasing in our new employees uh, who are helping us with both our call center and the adjudication of our claims. On last week, we, we reported we did have a few hiccups on call transfers. So as the week went on, we had fewer calls that were transferred, and, and the people at our call center were able to handle those uh, with just some routine questions, and fewer people um, were dropped. So we're looking at uh, the different metrics this week as well, the number of calls that were dropped and the number of calls that are being transferred. Steve with KPC Media. Mm -hmm. Hello, Steve. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Governor. Afternoon, Senator. Uh, but my question, as usual, will be for Dr. Box uh, regarding testing. Uh, it's been my understanding that in order to best know if we're making progress, ideally we'll want to see an increase in the number of tests that we're able to do while seeing uh, new cases stay flat or begin to decline. We've seen some uh, decreases in new cases in recent days, but a lot of times those have coincided with days where we've had a low number of tests processed. So mm -hmm. since we started talking about maximum capacity two weeks-ish ago, uh, Indiana seems to be falling short of utilizing that maximum on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you mentioned widening the guidelines for the couple drive-in locations that we've had around the state, but I guess my question is what are the guidelines for everyone else, hospitals, doctor offices, et cetera, uh, what are they operating under? And if, if we're not currently fully utilizing that capacity, do we have an opportunity to widen the scope of who should or shouldn't be tested? Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent question. I appreciate you giving me the op opportunity to speak to it. Um, I have said and I continue to say that I want our healthcare professionals to test anyone at this point in time that they feel has COVID-19 and specifically if they have any risk factors, it's incredibly important that we're testing. I also want to continue to test even those individuals that are admitted to the hospital when we know their chest x-ray or their CT scan of their chest is very clearly compatible with COVID-19, please document that as a case. And that's why we're opening up the testing at our four testing sites that we're doing now, and we are going to continue to expand those testing sites so that we can make sure that we are testing more and more Hoosiers. I'm very much looking forward to the ability to be able to test on site in a very quick manner so that we can give individuals a, an answer in a more quick fashion, like within 15 minutes. But I just don't have those cassettes yet to do that with the machines that we have. Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Afternoon, Brandon. Hey, Governor. Uh, this is a question for Senator Young and, and possibly for you, too. Okay. Um, should we be preventing private debt collectors and banks from seizing those stimulus checks to pay off uh, debts and, and um, uh, uh, past due fees? Thanks for the question, Brandon. I, I just learned that this was a challenge earlier today, and um, I've been discussing this with my team. Obviously, the purpose of the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, and as with so many of these other programs that we're providing to individuals, is to make them whole at a time that government, on account of, of public health, um, justification and, 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 and reasons has, has told them they can't go to work. And, and so to the extent uh, that's not happening and uh, those payments are instead being diverted to debt collection, um, that's, that's inconsistent with uh, where we're taking public policy. So uh, if there's an opportunity for me in, in a legislative capacity to uh, address this, uh, I'll look forward to working with those impacted stakeholders. Yeah, and, and Brandon, I just say that we're obviously working very closely with Senator Young's office uh, and understanding the intent of the CARES Act. We want to be in line with that, and we will be. Jake Thomas, Fox 55. Hello, Jake. Good afternoon. Hi, Governor. How are you doing? Good, doing good. Thank you. 
Yeah, my question for you and Dr. Box would be, as more people continue to die from COVID-19 and other causes of death, could you um, stress the importance of the new procedures that funeral homes have to take while people try to mourn the death of the, their loved ones? That, that's a very good question, and the CDC has some very specific direction for our funeral homes and how they handle the bodies of individuals that have passed away from COVID-19. Because we know this virus can live on the surface, it's important uh, that as you touch someone who has passed away recently from that, uh, especially in the, that first hour or so, if you're with them when they pass away, you want to make sure that you have the personal protective equipment on. My concern has been that frequently there have been other individuals individuals in the family that have been helping to take care of or have been involved um, and invested with this individual and they themselves could be at risk for getting COVID-19. And so for them to go to a funeral uh, with a number of people there, they could uh, run the risk if they're asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic of infecting other individuals. So it's a really, really difficult situation for families as they try to plan how to um, honor the life of their loved one. Um, I know that our funeral homes are doing a really good job of making sure that social distancing occurs and making sure that these are, are very small in number. But I know that a lot of families live across the United States and across the world and really can't travel at this time to come be with their loved ones. Whitney Downard, CNHI. Good afternoon, Whitney. Good afternoon. I've got two questions. Um, one, uh, Governor Holcomb, is a special session needed to cut the budget spending or to dole out that federal funding that we're getting under these various acts and packages? And two, when it comes to guidance from ISDH for nursing homes, are you picking which specific sites can be those COVID-dedicated facilities? And is this in reaction to what's happening in counties such as Davies and Delaware? Yeah, you want to take the second one first and then I'll get happy to. Yeah. This would be a facility that would basically stand up um, and raise their hand and say, we would want to become a COVID-19 unit. And we have basically formed um, a group of individuals, um, some of them from FSSA because of the um, uh, supportive financial part from FSSA and then from the Indiana State Department of Health because of the regulatory side and also from our Department of Aging here in the state to look at each facility and then to interact with the communities where this facility are located or facilities are located um, and also with the um, local hospital in that community because it's very important that everybody be working together for the best care of these at-risk individuals across our state. Yeah, and Whitney, Chris, I'll ask you to come up, but um, <clears throat> I, would, I would say not at this time, just to answer you directly. Um, most of these funding streams are formulaic and Chris, you might want to elaborate on kind of the 17 different columns of the budget and how the funding will flow when it arrives. Sure. Uh, first, Whitney, regarding your question reg uh, on the budget and uh, potential budget cuts, uh, Indiana does pass a two-year budget, a biennial budget, and so we're about halfway through that uh, two-year uh, cycle. The uh, governor has uh, the uh, power to uh, make adjustments in that budget, so a special session to make any sort of uh, adjustments on spending levels will not be uh, necessary. As far as the funding goes uh, from the federal government, uh, we will be uh, administering many of those revenue streams that are just additional funds uh, coming into existing grant programs, but part of it will uh, allow some discretion, and so just like uh, uh, monitoring our, our budget cuts. Uh, we'll also be looking at the, how we use those revenues in conjunction with the General Assembly uh, in advising them of the direction that we might be heading. You know, this is probably a good time for me to um, enter, and, and please, Senator, if you want to comment on this, but um, we've had a lot of discussions about and, and my cohorts around the country in 49 of their states and five territories about the need for more flexibility and, and the need to also balance. There's a lot of uh, states who have managed their budgets over the years to um, weather rainy days. That's Indiana's right. one of those states. And so we've been passionate as governors to try to plead our case to um, keep in mind that uh, some of us out here have been tending to our gardens. Um, in a responsible way and that funding that comes to our states 
should also contemplate that. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly hope that uh, this line of thinking is incorporated into our response to what is uh, certainly a national pandemic of a national nature, right? Uh, uh, akin to a 9-11 event, akin to uh, a war. The President of the United States uh, has, has declared this to be a, a national emergency. Um, and, and so we understand the national scope, um, but uh, I think we ought to also in incorporate into um, our, our funding provisions, if possible, um, some sort of mechanism to r recognize uh, that certain states have, have set aside reserves uh, for this rainiest of rainy days. And uh, we ought to be able to think critically through that so that uh, at, at some point when we do resume a semblance of normalcy, um, that rainy day fund uh, will still will still be around or will be over a period of time be replenished and and we haven't developed that mechanism yet I fully volunteer that to you but since uh, the governor uh, tossed the ball to me I, I thought I'd, uh, I'd, 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 I'd address that the other thing I, I would mention with respect to funding uh, here at the state level I, I, I don't steer into the state lane but we work together on a lot of different things and and so um, one of the mechanisms that we've provided at the federal level to assist, assist states and, and uh, other entities of government, counties and cities, has been through um, the Department of Treasury. They just announced a $35 billion equity investment in something they call their municipal liquidity f facility. So this is going to pr provide ultimately up to $500 billion, that's a half trillion dollars in direct financing to states counties and localities so that they have the funds necessary to provide essential services. And, and of course, you know, some states and cities have better credit ratings right. than others back to good governance. Our final question is from Michael WBEZ. Hello, Michael. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor, and good afternoon, Senator. Um, I've got to ask this question because today, uh, this afternoon, the mayor of Gary, Indiana, uh, has sent out a, a letter, and he says he is um, sounding the alarm for more resources in his city. There have been 185 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and five deaths, and he says they have exhausted all local resources in responding to COVID-19. What more can the state and federal government do to assist Gary, Indiana, which, of course, you know, as the second highest percentage of African-American residents of any city in the nation. Um, I was just on the phone with the mayor of Gary yesterday for about an hour and 15 minutes along with Director Cox and General Lyles and other individuals from our team. Uh, we were discussing the opportunities that we would have to help them um, should they have a surge that was larger than their health care systems could manage. We were also discussing the testing that is um, currently going on in Gary um, that we were, are doing there to try to make sure that it is easier for the their um, individuals to be able to be tested. So I think General Lyles could talk a little bit more about the plans there. Yeah, so uh, part of our surge strategy involves a very robust uh, reactionary force that we have here in the Indianapolis metropolitan area that would allow us to surge capabilities into the Lake County or Gary area if necessary. And what that consists of are packages of medical supplies and medical personnel that are able to then move and set up that capacity within 24 to 48 hours to meet the need of a city or a hot spot as it emerges. This allows us flexibility and agility to move very quickly to meet the demand whenever it's called for. And we have trigger points that will allow us to move very swiftly to do that. Those trigger points are things like what, are, what capacity are we reaching in the hospitals? What capacity do we have for ventilators? And where are we starting to meet that demand? And as soon as that trigger is made, we'll launch that capacity to meet the need. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be tomorrow at 2.30. All right, you've been listening to Governor Eric Holcomb and state leaders, including Senator Todd Young, holding their daily briefing on COVID-19. This after it was reported this morning that the numbers of both deaths 
and cases continue to grow across the state. We'll have much more on the news conference today coming up at 5 and 6. Mike and Anessa will be back with you at 4 for All Indiana.